Multiple flood evacuation orders are in place across the state. An emergency warning is in place for a bushfire. It is too late to leave and the only option is to shelter in place as the fire approaches. The key message from the State Emergency Service at this time is that all communities need to be aware of their risk and plan and prepare accordingly. Warnings are a critical component of emergency management and the evolution of both policy and practice over recent years has been transformative. A series of significant and tragic emergencies across Australia over the past decade has highlighted the power of warnings to save lives and a need to learn more about why some warning strategies were more successful than others. With funding and support from the Bushfire and Natural Hazard CRC, a multidisciplinary group of researchers from the Queensland University of Technology have been investigating the formation and impact of warnings. The findings of the research are important for people like Cathy Buck, Disaster Management Coordinator at Sunshine Coast Council. Cathy is part of a growing cohort of organisations that are being tasked with greater responsibility in the public information space. So my role entails um, the coordination of all emergency agencies um, as well as council. So it's about engaging with community prior to the event to let them know, okay, this event's coming, putting out warnings and advice to community to know, um, A, what's going to be happening, what that's going to look like on the ground, where that's likely to affect, and what they can be doing in preparation to that. Cathy is meeting with Professor Vivian Tippett from QUT's School of Clinical Sciences. Professor Tippett has been leading an interdisciplinary team of researchers in an effort to understand and improve warning messages. So I guess for me, um, trying to understand um, how this research came about and what prompted you to start looking into this, what was the actual issue we were looking at to yeah, begin with? Yeah. Um, we, we found ourselves in a meeting um, about seven and a half, eight years ago, where we were talking about some of the frustrations associated with particularly people driving in floodwaters and we got to wondering, we'd not met each other before, but we got to wondering whether or not there were things about our different positions in science that would could help us to understand why people don't do um, what we think they, we've asked them to do or they should do when they've had official messaging. So we got together and spent a bit more time and uh, wrote a proposal that would help us to explore from a psychological point of view what sort of things happen when people are asked to make decisions under pressure. You know, how do they respond to information? And then put all of, all of our subsequent effort into what sort of language can we use? What sort of message structure? Do images, do color? do uh, other, other types of uh, triggers make a difference to what people actually hear and how does that inform what they actually do. By bringing together expertise in marketing research, crisis communication and psychology, Professor Tippett's team set about trying to identify the best possible set of triggers to create behavioural response. In doing so, they had to take into account changes in normal decision making that occur when people are placed in stressful or unfamiliar situations. Uh, I think most of us have, have heard about and understood the fight or flight science which suggests that when you put uh, human beings and, and many mammals under pressure that a lot of their behavioural actions are driven by uh, changes in their hormonal structure. It's that primary and that forces us to make decisions about whether or not we're going to stay and fight uh, or run away basically. And whether you do that physically or you do it from a psychological standpoint, the drivers are very much the same. We also know that uh, people don't process complicated information necessarily in the same way that they do uh, when their mindset and their environment is different. And it's a very fine line between uh, being able to apply the added value of an adrenaline surge that comes with that fight or flight, uh, which sometimes can actually result in human beings doing the most remarkable things uh, in a good way. Uh, but 
It's a very fine line between that and, and not behaving, uh, not being able to problem solve, not being able to c conduct uh, an action in the way which would maximise your safety. Next, Cathy is meeting with Associate Professor Amisha Mehta, a Chief Investigator on the research team who specialises in crisis and risk communication to get a better understanding of some of the research findings and what these might mean for her emergency warnings role. So as far as I guess collaborative with your research, if you were to give me your top tips if I'm developing messaging for my community, what would your recommendation be in those top tips for me? The first thing I would do is look for where you might be biased to use operational or technical language and flip it. Think about what a community member may or may not know and stand in their shoes and think about what you need them to do. Our advice is lead with that behavioural action, uh, whatever the more abstracted behavioural action is, and then supplement that with the specific instructions that support that behavioural cue, be it prepare, be it leaving. Everything's contained within that one go-to piece. There's multiple players that are communicating during a natural hazard, media, but also people on Facebook and different kinds of groups and organisations as well. So thinking about how they work together and generally consistently is great, but when there is inconsistency in the messages, it can trigger um, concerns, misperceptions, and the use of visuals to tell part of a broader crisis narrative is really important. So when agencies can show what the fire looks like um, or show videos of what the fire looks like uh, and that can help offset some of the misperceptions that can arise as a result of mis uh, or conflicting cues. Recommendations from the QUT team have been used to produce practical guidelines and templates for emergency managers, such as Hazard Notes from the Bushfire and Natural Hazard CRC, the Public Information and Warnings Handbook produced by the Australian Institute for Disaster Resilience, and the Australian Warning System, which is a new national approach to information and warnings for hazards such as bushfire, flood, storm, cyclone and extreme heat. One organisation that has integrated the research findings into its warnings protocols is Queensland Fire and Emergency Services. Cathy is on her way to meet QFES Information and Warnings Manager, Kath Ryan, to get an understanding of how they use effective communication principles in their work. So this is the State Operations Centre, which is um, where we run our state um, level Queensland Fire and Emergency Services um, operations, I guess. So you can see that it's set up so that we've got all of the functional roles represented in here. Um, so operations, planning, logistics, um, and of course we've got public information. Um, so when this centre is activated, we would have a public information officer based in here. The research that's been done over the past um, couple of years has been so valuable to us as emergency services organisations to really shape what we're doing in the public information and warnings world. The world is changing, um, our communities are changing, the technologies are changing, our understanding of what is required from emergency messaging is um, definitely getting better. So we've got a mindset of continuous improvement and all of that research really gives us the opportunity to um, you know, make sure that we're continuously evolving what we're doing in the warning space and really meeting the needs of the community. Cathy is shown where the warning messages are generated and the templates that are used to help ensure that information is provided in ways that are easy to understand and act on. So the research has been really useful to us in um, figuring out how we're going to move forward with warnings and we've been able to take some um, really key concepts and apply them to our warnings templates. So for example, you can see that um, our warnings are broken up, um, so that chunking is really important um, with clear headers and our information in our warnings will be displayed as dot points because that um, research tells us that that makes it really easy for the community members to digest and retain. 
So you do warnings for all events, not just fire or, or anything like that? Uh, so at the moment in Queensland, um, QFES is responsible for warnings for bushfires, hazmat incidents and also structure fires. Mm -hmm. um, with the new Australian warning system coming into play, um, we're having really active conversations about um, which agencies should take that responsibility for issuing the new type of warnings um, for those other hazards. So flood, storm, cyclone and heat. Um, we'll see those these warnings principles applied um, much more closely into the future. Having spent time with the researchers and seen how the research outcomes can be applied at a practical level, Cathy is now able to reflect on her experiences and consider how she might apply some of her learnings to her own organisational setting. Mainly for me it's about understanding there's a lot of research that goes on behind the scenes that we don't know about and just seeing the culmination of that research as well as working with those state agencies it's, it's really good to see that it's actually happening so it's really good they get information from community from agencies and put it all together and it's just it fits really well. So my immediate team, I'd be certainly giving the information and, and the insight as to what I've experienced over the last few days, um, but certainly working with our media department and our communications branch to let them know, okay, this is what's actually being done, and then being able to work with them to say, let's look at this differently. Yes, ordinarily, if we're not the lead agent, we will just retweet, we post everything that word for word what you know QFES or those agencies do, um, but certainly when we are crafting our own messages, we understand now that we can put those elements into our work as well and really and work hard with our own communications within our own organisation as well as external to us um, to make sure we are giving the correct message and using those tips and tricks that I have picked up throughout this time. Mm -hmm.